Advisory Committee meeting. This is meeting number five on November 13th, 2023. Um, uh, tonight we've got a what looks like a relatively short agenda, but we are expecting to have a little bit of a dialogue when it comes to item number three. Um, we're gonna start out with doing some follow-up answers or clarifications. Um, from Peter Matthews. He's the gentleman with Matthews Builders and Movers, or I'm sure I'm saying his, the name of his company not quite accurately. But um, we, this group had raised some questions, and so I was able to reach back out to him to get some clarification. So we'll go over that. Um, thought we would just share some miscellaneous updates with the group some of which you may already know via email, but we like to restate them at the meeting so that it's public knowledge for anyone who might be watching at home either tonight or in the future um, via the, the, the web or um, YouTube or one of the many other places you might be able to find the video. Um, and then we are gonna spend probably a, quite a bit of time, Megan Clem from Landmark Society, um, who has graciously um, agreed to join us after Caitlin's departure onto um, wider audiences in New York State. Um, she's gonna talk about the various sort of assessment or analysis options that might exist and talk about sort of the scope of work, the what you typically, what the outcome or deliverable is associated with those different assessments and just a ballpark range and, and I think more importantly, some recommendations about what makes the most sense for this particular structure. Is that a fair assessment? I just like to make sure I'm describing what somebody's gonna say or do um, accurately. So I think without, for, if any, does anybody have questions or wanna talk about anything else or have questions about the agenda before I jump in? No? All right, just looking for some nods or other signs of life. Okay, perfect. So the first would be, and I just, I'm gonna pull up, like, I know I'm, I'm not expecting everybody to read it. I just took notes when I spoke um, with, with uh, um, Peter Matthews. And so in the context of picking up the barn to make repairs to timber frame structural supports, how long is temporary support needed? Um, he said normally Matthews building movers um, gives contractors 21 days with the temporary equipment to ensure the mason or other structural repair replacement contractor is incentivized to do the work in a timely manner. There is some flexibility for weather or unexpected delays. Um, they use metal beams and cribbing anywhere the building needs to be picked up to allow for repair. Um, and he, in this case, in the context of the Clark Road barn, he had no way to know the extent of where the building would need to be lifted since access to the basement and ground level was not viable. Um, and so generally that, that temporary support is only, it's not a long-term thing. It's really meant for the purposes of repair. Um, what's required for temporary support to be viable for any amount of time would just the roof need to be replaced or any other structural preservation measures associated with temporarily supporting a building? So his response to that was <coughs> fix the frame on the, compri uh, com that's supposed to be compromised, I'm sorry, uh, compromised areas before you repair or replace the roof or any other building elements, windows, et cetera, that will be impacted by the frame repair. So um, the that was his general recommendation because once you go to fix the the frame um, or the structural elements, anything else you might have done could shift and you might cause, you might, good money might be uh, not well spent. Generally speaking, the repairs to this type of structure would start at the bottom and work up. You only fix or repair or replace the roof and windows after you know the structure isn't going to shift anymore. Um, are there any proposed rehabilitation actions, roof replacement, lifting the barn, foundation repair, moving the barn or dismantling barn, seasonally dependent, meaning do they have to be started and or completed during a certain part of the year? He said somewhat seasonally dependent, more costly to do certain work in cold or inclement weather. Mason work costs less in the summertime than the winter when material storage is more expensive and enclosures are needed to allow proper curing of the concrete. That obviously, and then I'm sure labor costs increase as well. People expect to be paid more to work in um, inclement, inclement weather. Other contractors re, uh, roofing will charge more to work in inclement, inclement weather as well. 
Um, do you know the, how extensive the repairs to timber frame structural supports would be based on your field observation? Is there evidence of significant damage to these supports? And he said the timbers, corners, and main sills that hold up the roof rafters are so big, it would take a long time for them to rot. Gambrel wasn't sagging, et cetera, but he couldn't see underneath to know what the conditions are in the basement to give a better determination. So he wasn't obviously um, wanting to uh, guess on that front. Um, what's the estimated cost of carefully dismantling, labeling, and rebuilding the barn at a separate location? He said there's no way to give the number. The answer would depend on how much you want to salvage and or reuse. And then he referenced his own barn. Um, he, he said for their barn, a crane, Oh, for our barn, no, for the, our, he was going back and forth and giving examples of other projects. He was saying for our barn, a crane would probably need to be on site for a week. Um, and it's five to 10,000 a day just for that piece of equipment. F salvaging the siding would not, would likely be costly due, due to the time consuming process of removing tongue and groove construction. Siding might not be salvageable because of it being tongue and groove. Um, uh, the d nail damage and broken boards, it's very um, likely that happens during uh, deconstruction or it's very time consuming process that would be labor, ex um, ex very expensive labor costs. I think that's where he shared his own personal experience where when they were, were salvaging a barn, I think that his brother was going to be converting to something else. They salvaged the structure element, structural elements, but the siding they re ended up replacing for this similar reason. So that sort of summarizes the answers or the clarifications that were requested based on Peter Matthews' original um, walkthrough at, and site visit. Um, again, you know, the, he, he has a, a lot of experience in that realm, so that was good information to have. Um, I think, as we're going to talk about in a little bit later, any more detailed sort of estimates would really be a next step. That's not something he's equipped to say, like, to provide. But between this and the information we had originally gathered from him, it was a good starting point as far as maybe an idea of order of magnitude of what might be involved. Um, okay, so I'm gonna go back to that. So any questions about that before we jump away? Anything we wanna talk about about Peter's comments and or responses? Not really, no, okay. Um, so some miscellaneous updates, just these are things that were raised at previous meetings or raised in general. I know I sent an email out a few weeks ago that the barn tarp has been repaired and or replaced and the, the places where it was coming away, those have been replaced and then a second layer has been provided um, to uh, try to shore it up um, for a longer period of time so that it's not going to fail as especially approaching um, win winter months. So that that's already taken place and that's been uh, handled and I haven't seen, I don't recall, there's not been any signs of damage to it since it's been repaired. No, no okay. signs of damage yet. Okay, wonderful. There's, there's actually a little bit, I was out there on Friday and I was... Oh, okay. Uh, we're, we're one of the grommets or whatever where it's screwed in, it's it's ripping around there um, okay on the right side so you can see. Okay. right All on right. the right side uh yeah i sent some images you can see it in if uh, you know it, mike i michael i did um save the um i downloaded the images and the movie um flyover that you shared with me they're in the google drive okay um i copied them over this morning and then tim i have the photos downloaded to okay. the project folder okay. so i will send you a link to yep. those um, so you can have them as well. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, the other que one of the other questions, and I'm going to be pointing to Matt or Amy to remind me of other updates if I'm missing them. One of the other questions that came up at a previous meeting was inquiring with the um, the team at Bergman, now known as Co Bergman, has since been purchased by a, a larger um, engineering company called Colliers. So I'm going to say Bergman Colliers just for clarity um, for the Clark House project to find out it would it be feasible for elements, the you know any salvaged 
timber material to be somehow reutilized um, in the Clark House project. And so they were looking into that. They, they thought for sure there would be ways for them to incorporate it. Obviously, it wouldn't be um, structural in nature. It would be more decorative. Um, it, not uh, they wouldn't be using the beams to construct the new um, addition, but there's they certainly thought there would be ways to reutilize um, pieces um, and I think the extent would be something that they'd be looking for direction from the town board if that was the direction the town board wanted to go in so that's sort of a it can be done um, and then the extent and what that would mean or entail would need to be determined based on you know next steps. Um, so just early answer is yes, and then the how and what that means would be need to be determined. Um, other, am I forgetting another update or no? That's the only. No, yeah. Yeah, I think we, that was essentially it. Um, yeah, without knowing what's salvageable from the barn yet, it's hard to make that assessment on Bergman's side. So right. Um, yeah, I think that was essentially it. Okay, all right. Um, so, okay, so I think with one of the things that we spent some time talking about at the last meeting was the idea of an historic um, structure report. And so I reached out to, at the time, Caitlin, um, to ask her about, okay, what's the ballpark scope of service for that? What's the general cost? Um, and so I could start to figure out an RFP process for that type of a service. And then... Uh, Caitlin quickly wrote back, do you mean, you don't mean a historic structure report, do you really mean a conditions assessment? And sort of went through the various differences between those two things and why she thought that the Clark Road barn might be better suited to a conditions assessment instead of a historic structure report, just based on the scope and what the intended purpose of those analyses are. So in talking with um, um, Candace, Lee, and other town board members, they thought it'd be best to come back to this board, this committee, with more information about what do those things mean, so that if we're gonna move in a direction of doing further study, what does that look like? So without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Megan, who's gonna just maybe give a rundown of those, the differences. Sure, so I'll make this pretty quick, but if you have questions, of course, I can try to answer those as well. Um, I'll just put a little caveat on this before I start that with some of these estimates, as far as timeline and cost, they are, again, estimates. It would really depend on, you know, contractors and who you're working with to, to take on the report should you decide to move forward. So the first one is the historic structure report. Um, and the purpose of this report really is to look deep, a deep delve into the history of the structure. So that includes um, things like finding original plans if they exist, looking at the materials of the building, um, previous alterations that may have happened, the use of the building. So really looking into the you know, the overall history of the building, um, which in this case, could be somewhat difficult only because generally when historic properties are documented, they always focus on the main building, which would be the Clark House in this case. Um, and looking over the local landmark designation through the town of Penfield, it really only talks about the house and the people who owned it. So there's a starting point there. Um, but in general, it can be hard to do a deep delve into an outbuilding or a barn on its own. Um, so if you were to do that, you'd probably have to include kind of the whole property and do a deep delve into the history of the property as a whole to find much about the barn if you can find anything. But also included in that historic structures report usually has a bit of um, a feasibility study included with it and a conditions assessment. It's a little bit of everything rolled into one. But the main focus of it would be that historic context of the barn. Um, and for that reason, you know, that can cost anywhere from you know, approximately like $20,000 and up from there. And that's just because it is such a deep dive and it includes everything in it. Um, Caitlin and I discussed before she left Landmark, you know, a historic structures report. And it seemed for what the purpose of what you're trying to do with this barn, really getting a deep delve into the history of the barn itself isn't probably going to lead you in the direction you want to go. 
it sounds more like what you might want to look at would be the phys a feasibility study or a conditions assessment. So to talk about those a little bit, and I should say to a historic structures report, because it is so involved, can take approximately a year or more, and often it includes an actual construction project as part of why you're doing a historic structures report. Usually the final report includes um, a, an entire section on the changes that happened to the building with the actual construction project happening. So in that case, a historic structures report here too wouldn't necessarily be something you'd be able to complete, you know, before something happens with the barn itself. Can I ask a question before you jump on? Sure. Can you give examples of places that have done historic structure report? Yes, thank you for that. I, I do have that in here. So one of the things that we had said to Carrie in the email was generally historic structures reports are done on really significant or unique properties, and not that the Clark Road barn is not significant historically, um, but we're talking properties like the Quaker Meeting House or George Washington's Mount Vernon or, um, you know, like George, the George Eastman House, things of that magnitude. Generally, you're not doing them for an outbuilding, um, mainly because it can be hard to find that type of information. But generally, it's, it's a very in-depth documented process that you wouldn't normally do with a barn type structure. Okay. Thanks. Sure. And thank you for reminding me to share that. <laughs> um, the next one would be a feasibility study, which um, I'm sure you all know what that is, but that's really a, a, um, an exploration or evaluation into the alternatives uses of the building, what it could be reused for, or is it just um, left as is, and kind of finding the viability of those options. And that would require working with a qualified consultant who does that type of work. Um, generally, the output of that would include things like technical, economic, financial, legal, and environmental considerations. They usually also include an existing conditions report within it or a, a general conditions report. It doesn't necessarily go as in-depth as a conditions assessment will. Um, and then it usually will also include costs that could be associated with that general scope of work that might need to be done based on the conditions of the building. With a feasibility study, I would say generally, in my experience with those, it depends on the structure and again, of course, the consultant and how quickly they can work on it, but it could take anywhere from six months to a year or more to do. Um, and I would say generally, you're probably looking at about 10,000 to 20,000, so a little less than the historic resources survey. And again, because you're not including that really in-depth history part of the project. Then the conditions assessment, um, which is kind of where what Caitlin and I were thinking may be more what you all might be looking to do. And the conditions assessment is exactly what it is, assessing the existing conditions of the barn um, and then putting together a project scope. So basically what would happen is the consulting team that you work with, whether that's an architecture firm, generally you would say in this case you'd want to work with probably an architecture firm that has experience in preservation and working with historic buildings because they really understand how, it's, it's a little different than new construction, so they really understand how that works. Um, generally, what they do is they go through, they do the conditions assessment, so they tell you, you know, where there's deterioration beyond repair, where there's places that could be repaired, and then they go into a projected project scope of work, and they assign kind of cost estimates that go to that. So it's a little bit, probably the, the, the smaller scale of what you're looking at, but probably would do more good for the purpose of what you're looking to do with the barn. Um, I would say that, that again, I would say it could be anywhere from six months to a year to take on these projects. I, I generally put a, a, a year time frame on projects as a ballpark of what the reality is for most of these to be um, completed. And kind of like the feasibility study, the cost range could be anywhere from about 10,000 to 20,000. But with, with the barn being a smaller building, it could be a little bit less than that. So um, it really just depends on, which is why I would say it would definitely be a good thing once you decide kind of which direction you wanna to take to put the RFP out to kind of see what are your real costs that you're looking at. Um, the reason that we would recommend a conditions assessment or a feasibility study is because the, the purpose of this committee is looking at new uses or potential new uses for the barn. 
Does it stay where it is and become something else? Does it get moved? Um, you know, and a feasibility study is what's really going to help you determine that long term. And again, like I said, that would an outcome of that would include other considerations like economic considerations, financial um, considerations. And it would include a conditions report of some sort along with those estimated costs. So you could kind of ball that into one. Um, so I hope that gives a little bit of an idea. So I'd say here, we're the Landmark Society, at least, for what we understand you're trying to do with the barn and in this process would be a feasibility study or a conditions assessment rather than the historic resources um, or the historic structure report. OK. Do you have questions? I have a couple questions. For the historical um, survey report, has the, does Landmark Society have any other truncated versions that maybe isn't that full scope? So we um, have not done a historic structures report yet. Our consulting services is fairly new. Um, so it's just not a project we've taken on yet. So we don't personally have examples of it. Um, but the reality is, is you could make it whatever you want it to be with your consultant. So, you know, um, I, I mean, I feel like it wouldn't be an overly burdened thing to do with the historic um, structure report just because the barn is a small property. But again, like I said, I don't think it would be possible to just do historic research on the barn. You'd have to include the entire property with it, which does make it a little bit bigger project. The other question I have, too, is what are the sources of information that would feed into that structure of historic structure report. I, I know from checking with our town historian, they don't have any records. Yes. They have no records. They have a map that shows, you know, the building location from 1924. Um, but that's the extent of the information. So I don't, without right. it, like with it pre obviously predating building permit requirements and things like that, the, I'd be curious about what other resources, and I'm sure, and this is not my area of expertise, so there may be lots of fun things to, to be looking up and records to search. So I, I'm, I'm trying to understand, again, with the scope, so I understand that with just that, um, what did you call it, an outbound property or out, outside property, that there might oh, not be outbound. as much information, mm -hmm. but if we get at least with the scope, if we limit it to uh, that parcel of the property, like I don't need, you know, um, uh, the Clark Lodge or Clark House, for example, right? Right. Um, if, if it's, I'm, I'm just trying to see, is do we have a path forward here um, with that historical uh, report? And it, can we can we at least start it? And if, if they say, look, we've given like three hours of like expert good faith effort, not finding anything, can we put it in the scope of work that it would then be abandoned? I don't really need to to comb through like all this other extraneous information. Do you know what I mean? Right. Yes. I, I can, I happen to know the, yeah. <laughs> I happen to be married to the assistant. <laughs> well, uh, that, yes. Yeah. And uh, Anne and I have both worked actually quite a lot. And um, yeah, there really is not very much to work with. Uh, um, we were hoping for a probate inventory. Um, the deeds are very general for the entire parcel. Um, and you, you, yeah, the documents really just are not there to tell you much about it. It looks like from sale prices, uh, between Alpheus Clark and Thomas uh, Clark, 1831 to 1850, that seems to be the window uh, where the barn likely went up. But it could have been 1849 or it could have been 1832. There's just really not documents, which is why examining the actual physical structure itself, I think, is going to really be the only way forward. Um, yeah, the documentary record is just not kind to Penfield or this part of Penfield. So that that's helpful to know. And I, of course, I defer to, to um, Anna here. I mean, I tried to do a Google search and couldn't really find much on it. So I wasn't sure what other, like you said, first or second hand yeah, resources there would be. You'd be going to the county clerk's office to look at what are handwritten deeds and filings. And it it's, you know, you're looking on microfiche and... We, it's, we've already looked and you, at those. And you've okay. done that. It sounds like, Michael, you've already done that work with Anna um, to the extent that you can even accomplish that, right? So, I mean, I, I understand the, the recommendation at least for the feasibility or the conditions report, but I, I don't wanna get too far down that path because I think 
it, it would be tough for me if the town were to say, look at the, the conditions consultant, you know, go ahead into the building and do whatever report, but other persons were denied entry. Like I, I can't rationalize that. So I think if the town had already made a decision um, for safety reasons, for insurance rider purposes or liability, what other purposes that it was not going to be um, accessible, then it, um, I, I don't think the feasibility, like if we, we want to get inside, I understand, right? And that conditions report is going to be very limited because I think Clayman, we all know that, that it's not, in the best condition, you know? So I wouldn't want to spend another $20,000 to tell me, yeah, it's falling apart, right? Right, and I think the important thing to realize with the feasibility study, or the especially with the conditions assessment, is that while getting inside the building may be important for them to be able to do that, really it would be, you know, if you're looking at the Clark Road barn and can it be reused for something, the only way you can ever get that answer is to do a conditions assessment or a feasibility study. Otherwise, you can throw out ideas all day long about what you could do with it. Do you move it to another property? Do you parcel it off and sell it to someone else? But at the end of the day, someone would have to do some type of feasibility study or conditions assessment to go anywhere forward with that. Yeah, Bob? Can the consultant... Bob, I think you're going to get yelled at by the folks downstairs. Can, can the <laughs> consultant uh, hold the town harmless with regards to accessing the building? I think that could be written into an RFP. Um, I think in the past we were... The, that could be a, a requirement or a certain amount of um, insurance, liability insurance, so that that could be, could be something. Um, you know, I, I think the other question I would have is, again, the I'm wondering when that conditions report makes sense to delve into because we're this committee is charged with looking, there's many alternatives that are being looked at. Um, if, you know, should that conditions assessment come later down the line once it's been determined for sure that the town's going to preserve it, other other options that could be explored in the meantime. Um, you know, if, uh, like for example, if preservation is really the primary consideration and the most important thing, which we talked about, could the, should the town look at doing an RFP to see if anyone, nonprofit or private organization wants it, would want to relocate it, you know, for the cost of a dollar, you can take the barn and, you know, with the in, intent of it being repurposed or salvaged, like is that something that the town board should consider as a interim to see, okay, is there any interest in somebody else like wanting to save the barn or use the barn? Because we've, we've seen a lot of examples, you know, of other barns being relocated. It's happening, you know, in some cases in the private sector and there seems to be, you know, barn dominiums are quite the, quite the thing right now in terms of conversion. Barn Dominium. It's when people convert a barn into a habitable living space. <laughs> um. And there are a few other examples. I know I was looking through all of the past um, meeting minutes earlier today, and there were some examples of other barns that had been moved um, yep. before. And there are a couple um, that we actually just gave a landmark award to that are in Perry. Um, a Wells Barn. I can't remember if they're both Wells Barns. Um, but they were moved by a private property owner to their property and and redone beautifully they use them as event venues but it's just another example of of that kind of thing and also to make another point totally understand your um, concern you know the building's not really safe to be in a lot of um, consultants who would do conditions assessments most of them now actually use um, drones quite often so that could be a way to see the interior and and you know it could be kind of dark in there but there We've are done ways the that they drone to footage inside and out um at the town level, I don't. I think it was limited viewing of the lower level, the lowest level, which, which is the challenge because right. that's the sort of the, the unknown at this point. So I guess you know, Candace, I don't know what your what the best outcome here is. We've heard you know the three options. Do we want to have this con continue this con up to the committee? I think um, right. Is there some some specific or net, you know? Again, because this would be a town board action would be needed because there'd be a budget appropriation required. Is there something that the committee thinks would be really valuable at this stage? Are there other steps that we should take? Um, you know, what are your thoughts? I think part of the 
uh, questioning about the historical study was, you know, what's the historic value? What would be lost if if that was repurposed, or uh, you know, or what's the what's the motivation or uh, grounds for putting money into it to restore it or whatever? But it sounds like there isn't really a path to finding out much more of the history or making that determination. Is that correct? From the initial looks that you've done, uh, Michael, I would say. You know, on its own, if you're trying to look at documents like they've already been looking through, I mean, it's hard to tell the history of a barn without looking at the entire property because a barn is part of an agricultural complex. So it's, you know, you're probably never going to find something that just specifically talks about the barn because the barn is significant in association with that complex. And the barn is significant because of the people who lived there, built the barn, and used it for agricultural purposes. So outside of that whole connection, the barn is still significant because it's historic and it's still, you know, even in its condition, it's still pretty intact. It might just not be in great condition. Um, so that's that's somewhat the hard part of what we're talking about with the historic structures report, why that might not be the avenue you want to take, only because even if you had a written history of the property, which in my mind is a preservationist and a history person, of course that is always needed to have things documented. but. Um, I guess in, in the case of what you're doing here with the barn and trying to figure out with the barn is that it, it doesn't really help you move forward with determining what to do with the barn to know, you know, the history of the families who lived there necessarily. And that's, and you know, as a preservationist, I love when people do historic structures reports, but in this case, does it make sense to do that is what I guess kind of the point we're getting to. I'm, I'm hung up on the idea that that it really wouldn't matter how historically significant it was if the condition is so bad that you can't reuse it. And I would think that you could hire someone to do a professional but cursory review of whether or not the, the structural members are at, actually Salvageable. in a good enough condition to be able to reuse them if you could take it apart, and whether there's so much deterioration in all of the other components of the building that if they were to take it down and put it up somewhere else, you wind up with a truck load rather than a tractor trailer load. Oh, that's a, yeah, I think, I wonder if the, for the, Matt, we didn't look at the Perry project in detail, did we, as part of I, background uh, and? Not, no, I can't remember. So, I mean, might be worth having a conversation with some folks and related to that project just to understand sort of what the condition was of the structures that were relocated, how they manage it. it might just be good fact finding for us as a group. Certainly, I mean, I think the, you know, I, as far as w if a conditions report was something that this committee felt like was important, we could look at that RFP and then see you know, have a, a clause that doesn't commit the town to proceeding if the costs come in and they're cost prohibitive. Um, is that something that maybe is a, a, a middle ground so that you can at least get an idea of the, the cost associated with doing that work and compare apples to apples as far as um, folks qualify to do a conditions assessment of that nature and for this type of a building. I feel like this is a select, it's, I'm sure lots of people would feel like they're qualified to do it. I think there's not that many that really know the ins and outs of a historic structure like this. So um, I don't know what your thoughts are. Yes. So, and I, is it Mike? Or who's, Bob. I, I, like, I like his comments. There was, I had similar thoughts in okay. terms of stressing. At the moment, we keep flying blind in my estimation. That we have no idea... Is a barn even worth doing anything with? And as much as having some historical perspective could be helpful, but we're trying to decide, can we take it apart and use it somewhere else? Or is it in good enough condition that we could actually turn it into another asset for the town? And so to me, the, the base you know, condition assessment, just a baseline just to get in there and for someone to finally put some facts and numbers and something to it because Something's going to come out of that that's going to make a lot of options just go away mm -hmm. because it's just, we're just going to know it's just totally unfeasible. It's in such bad shape. So now we're limited to who wants to buy it for the beams or renovate it for the, uh, the house. 
without some of that background information, we're just sitting around here talking about what everybody else did and not have any idea what we can do. And I think putting together an RFP to get someone to start telling us what it's going to cost to do that, and, and I understand we had these re, you know, restrictions about liability, but you know, my experience with town governments, not this one, is that you know, throw the biggest uh, net over that to keep everybody else out. You know, but now if we really want to do something, I don't, does this town have an attorney? We, we do have a town attorney, attorney, yes. You know, working with that person, say, okay, what's our limits? Who, where do we want to put that? What are the restrictions? Who do we want to work on it? Who's done this before? Who has gone into dangerous situations to make an assessment? You know, we got to trust that they know what they're doing and and create the right relationships. So, I, th I think we really have to start with that basic fundamental data. It's just going to make a lot of other future decisions, I think, easier. Yeah, and I mean, I'm renovating a barn now in Ontario County, and um, so I, I think that there, to me, this is not like a scary thing, you know, because I'm doing it, so, it, but it may be scary to other people, but um, I agree that we need to know if it's, what's going on in there so that we can make those decisions, and I would, you know, we, I just keep hearing these sort of negative things about the barn that it's too far gone and it's this and it's that no it's it's not or else it wouldn't be standing so um you know it might be worth saving i mean that's where i come from so i just kind of want to see what's going on in there but i i think people like uh, um, uh mr peter matthews in a hour's time inside the building could render a much better opinion about whether it's about to fall on down or whether it is structurally adequate to support disassembling it from the outside. And I, I don't think you have to spend thousands of dollars to get that opinion or even two opinions like that. The condition ass assessment, um, whatever you said, it, was, it could cost 10 or 20,000 or something. But th does that come up with uh, estimates for rehabilitating the barn? Yes, so a conditions assessment would include, um, it, it would kind of have an outcome where the consultant would work with you to find out you know, what is the avenue you really want to go down, and that would be the main focus of the conditions assessment, because the report that would come out would then include their kind of step-by-step, -step, um, here's the work that needs to be done, here's the cost associated with it, but what they also do is they lay it out, generally it's in like a, here's what you need to do now between year one and year five, here's what you need to do between year five and year ten, so that it's not necessarily something you have to do all at once, all of the work, they help lay it out in a more feasible manner to be able to actually undertake a project as well. So I think I'm in the same place. Maybe this is where you were coming. We, uh, how can we even have a conversation if we don't know what the costs of doing some of these things would be? So then if that were the case, the in order to define a scope of services for somebody to respond to, we'd have to have some idea of whether or not the final product was going to be conditioned space. In other words, Built conditioned means it's got heating, cooling, it's, it meets energy code requirements, you know, it, it can be occupied and, or is it meant to be more of a structure that's how it was originally constructed, not to be conditioned, no um, utilities on site. It was likely used for animal or hay storage, likely, maybe, we're not sure. Um, so that would be the other question that, because that's going to drive, you know, the conditions assessment process. I would suggest, and I could be wrong, I think that's asking a little bit too much for what I was thinking about in terms okay. of right now we just need to know, is this barn going to fall apart in two years? And, and if it is, then we just got to let it go and figure out how to salvage it. Or with this kind of report, it may say, you know, because uh, it's going to give us some, uh, uh, you know, I was thinking, uh, somebody used the term stabilizing it, I think, or something like that. I mean, this first step may just be, can you stabilize it so you have the time to figure out what the uses may be, conditioned, non-conditioned. So I don't think, the, in my interpretation of what you're saying is we don't have to have the scope of work such that 
whatever they're going to suggest as a feasibility standpoint is going to take us to the end product. It's just next five years, here's some feasibility things. Number one, spend $100,000 so it won't fall down. And the town can say, well, that's too much. And so we're not going to yeah. let it fall down, but we're going to now look at how do we salvage some of the parts, use it somewhere else. If they say, the analysis says for $25,000, you can stabilize this thing and it'll be good to give you five years to figure it all out, it may be worth the money. But until we have any of that foundation, I keep sitting around thinking we're just mm -hmm. whistling in the wind. Are there I agree. <laughs> <laughs> are there a lot of different companies that do this, or is it just like one or two or a 10 people that you can draw from to do these um, condition assessments? There are, and that's something we do have a referral program at Landmark Society, so if you want to Oh, you know I was going to be uh, sending send an email. Referrals. <laughs> um, and it's all um, companies that we have had positive feedback from other property owners who have similar um, scopes of work that they've had done. So um, we've got architectural firms in the area that specialize in preservation that do conditions assessments all the time. Um, there's some engineering firms that have people that can do that. So we could be able to give you that. And it would be, I'd say, at least a handful of people um, in the area that could do that. Yeah, thank you. And and I suspect with those people, you know, this, some group could sit down with them as, as you may be working on a, this town's RFP to get more specific about limiting where they're going to go, how much you really want from them. I mean, it's been my experience with these things. You can get them to do part A, knowing that if you really like it and there's something there, you, you, can, you can take them a little bit further down the road. But you don't have to get everything lined up and funded and all that kind of stuff. Do, you know, do something basic that has to be defined in the RFP. Don't know what that is yet, but enough to inform the group in the town is there anything worth going forward, and, and in what way? I just, I just wanted to clarify. From the conditions um, assessment, I thought I heard as part of the uh, Tom's question for the estimates that it's going to be based on intended use of the barn. Is that right? No. So with conditions assessment, what that really does, I mean, they could gear the kind of the results of what they're putting together towards what you want the intended use to be. I think in this case, that's something this group is still exploring. So generally, conditions assessment is really just going in, looking at the existing conditions as they are, and pretty much talking about what you had kind of mentioned as being the first step, really giving you a, um, a scope of work to stabilize the building would be the first one. So when I mentioned that, you know, often they'll give you a scope of work of here's what has to be done in year one to five. That's generally the stabilization work. If it's, you know, the foundation's going to collapse, they'll put the foundation work in years one to five. Um, that sort of thing. So generally, it's a conditions assessment won't bring you to the final end of the project. That would then move on further to working with an architecture firm and an engineering firm who would actually do all the drawings and things like that. So when you said it has the part of costs associated with engineering architecture, what is, did I miss here? What was that portion on then? So the costs associated with the conditions assessment would be in, in the report survey results, um, those costs would be associated with the work items basically to stabilize the building. So it okay, would be, so, okay. here's yep. the cost yep. of what a roof would be, here's the cost for a foundation. But one of the possibilities is, one of the possibilities is that they will take a look at it and find out that it's not worth $15,000 to stabilize it to be able to study it longer. Right. I mean, you may be able to take the barn down for $15,000 and eliminate the fence and the insurance and the long-term maintenance on that. Okay. So I, I just wanted to at least let the, the committee know, I think we talked about it previously, the barn is no longer covered by the town's insurance. That was one of the reasons that it was prohibited entry. So there, we're no longer paying insurance on the property. There are the um, fees we pay on, a, I believe it's a six month for the fence rental, which I can't remember what the cost was, Tim, but. Yeah, um, it was around. 600, was yeah. that right? Well, six, no. it was like five to 6,000. I'll, I have five to six thousand for each six-month period. 
and then to re up it, it was another. It was a lesser fee for it after is, that. Uh, yeah, I we have the information for the initial. It was like around five. Yeah, I think. Okay. If we're, yeah. Okay. Well, whatever the dollar amount was, but, but I, I, but I, I, I appre completely appreciate where you're, well, where you're coming if, from. If, if we're going to uh, uh, study it for multiple years and restore it over an extended period of time, we ought to buy that fence. <laughs> <laughs> Just to clarify for everyone, the initial installation with the six months was 4739 okay. Every six-month renewal of the fence is $3,726. Jeez. Goodness gracious. Yeah, because the fencing, there if it's on our site, it means it's not somewhere else. And so... It, you know. And the fence is made of like pure silver. <laughs> yeah. Buy the it, fence and sell it back to them. <laughs> so... Um, yeah. Okay. Well, I would say that knowing we're in a bit of a catch-22 now, we need to know the condition of the foundation, the frames, and really to a lesser extent the sheathing or siding. The foundation's conditions, once assessed, can know whether we need to move it or whether you know it's it's a viable site where it is or not. The frame, I think, is the very the most important part of this. Uh, large timbers that you really can't be replaced, uh, and knowing whether those are rotted or not um, becomes the next, you know, uh, if you will, pass through. Whether the barn again is worth just you know saving parts of, or can be has structural integrity. In some ways, the comments you already had with Peter Matthews, he said there's no sagging. It looks very strong. Um, at least from his expert opinion, the frame looks quite promising. Um, yeah, at the and, corner, like without being able to see underneath. But yes, he was yeah. saying, I think. And he said he couldn't put a dollar figure on the cost of dismantling and moving in his current condition of not being able to see it. So this is where access to an assessment of the actual physical integrity of the timbers is uh, is very important. And I sort of throw out the sheathing part, uh, the siding, uh, because Peter Matthews and I agree with it. The sheathing may be replaced and more recent than the, the timber frame anyway, and it is extremely time consuming and expensive to uh, save the, if you will, the thin skin of, of the barn. Um, but a conditions report, we really, it will give us a lot. It will, as you said, eliminate some paths um, and uh, determine keep on site or have to move the framing, whether it can be sort of meet, moved and re-erected elsewhere. Um, so really, without a, investing in a conditions report, um, we really can't do much of anything. And I would say the one thing, historic document that would really help us uh, is the tax records for the town of Penfield, which we've been looking for but can't find because if, again, you build a barn between, you know, in 1835, your, your tax will jump from, you know, $3 to $8 or something. So there are documents actually that can historically pinpoint some of these things. Uh, and then perhaps with a conditions report, um, the barn itself can tell us some aging in that, uh, you know, a core from a piece of original structural uh, uh, timber can be, again, dendrochronologically dated. And we could say, is this an 1835 beam or is this, you know, 1920 or so the, yeah, a, a conditions report can actually give us historical information as well. I, I think that the method of construction will help date it also because uh, the, the manner in which they were built in 19 or 1860 and, and in 1910 were considerably different. I mean, they're hand hewn. Do they still have the bark on the members? Or did they pin them or did they use mechanical fasteners? I, I think they can get a pretty good idea when that frame went up. So if I'm hearing at least group consensus, um, the conditions report seems to be the the 
recommended step. Okay, so Carrie, I think um, our takeaway is this is on the agenda for uh, work session before the town board this Wednesday. And so that Carrie will relay that recommendation. Yep. I think one of the also takeaways would be to ask the comptroller to look at tax records um, to the earliest extent possible to see if we have anything else. Um, and then uh, part of the work session, it may be one, two, three sessions, but it'll be a discussion of whether or not to uh, have a resolution f uh, for the RFP to be um, published, but we can at least start on that, Carrie. Sure, and yeah, I think, absolutely. Um, I've raised this before <laughs> with the board too, and uh, I, I definitely understand like for meaningful discussion, we need to have some basis, but I think it was, um, I, I think it needs to be reconsidered uh, at least to allow a drone or something inside. And, and I've, I've been of the, the mind of if folks want to go in, it's like enter at your own risk, you know, and, and we have plenty of legal language to throw in there for liability releases, you know. And again, I'm not encouraging this team to go in, right? But I think it, it should at least be as part of that discussion, if not... Um, because I, I just don't understand. I, I get the rationale that they're experts, da 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 but it's still a person, you know, going in, and whether the floor is unstable, if expert or not, it's going to fall, you know? So, again, I'm not encouraging, like, yeah, I think willful entering. Typically, but. those providers, though, have their own insurance, and they have to require, they carry their own yep. insurance to protect themselves yep. if there were to be, and they have a hold, no, har, hold harmless agreement um, in place with the town so that the town is not responsible for their safety. Oh, I, I, so fully aware of that, but yeah. I'm saying um, it was previously decided that we wouldn't even allow drones in. And I know PCTV did their thing as well, but I think the overhead drone from, from Mike was really informative, right? And it, at least it helped me to get a better better aerial view. So I'd, I'd want that all pitched on Wednesday. If, okay. I mean, I'll be there too. To yes. If you feel more comfortable. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm happy to relay the, 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 the committee's, time, so. yeah. No, I'm happy to relay the so, committee's um, recommendation. So I, I appreciate the caution and what the town did to make sure that other people weren't in there, and, and I, tonight I heard that you dropped your insurance coverage in that building, which makes it even yeah, more onerous, and that's good. why you would do that. And so, to me, again, my experience with RFPs is you need to make it very clear in the RFP what the terms and conditions are yes. for these people going in there. And I suspect, and I don't know that many people, but I suspect pe these people who have been doing this, who are experienced, this is not the first barn they've gone into that's, or, or structure that may have some jeopardy or some concerns, and, and they know what they're doing. And again, with the RFP, you're going to get the right person. Depend, you know, depends upon who that is, you know, maybe more expensive or something. But, you know, I think we have to spend some money here to get some real professional input to give us a sense that we're just going and there's nothing you can do or there's so much you can do. So, I mean, I just... Is, yeah. is it possible to get a, a, a proposal for a, an initial visit? And if that's affirmative, do you go to doing more of a study to do more of a... I think that's something that we can talk about at the town board level in terms of how can you structure the scope so there's some initial review or not, like, in other words... A, a, for a lack of a better term, a gut check, if you will, so that you're not doing a, f you know, there might be like a, a staged, a scope of service, if you like to an ad can conduct the analysis, and then if further study is needed, or it seems like it might be worth further study, then to look at that, I, I'd have, we'd have to take a look at it to see how you'd build it that way. Does the committee want to see the RFP or at least um, the proposal before it goes out? So. It, it will delay the RFP being published, but I, I, I just to, to have your continued involvement or yeah, I mean, or are you you okay with Carrie moving forward with your thoughts? And just for the record, Carrie moving ahead with this project would mean me asking Megan to provide me examples of other scopes of service that have been <laughs> done in the community, and me also calling other towns and folks I know that have experience with historic preservation that have done projects that require this kind of analysis. So um, we don't re we don't reinvent the wheel here. We <laughs> build off a wheel that's already been built somewhere else. Um, I, I don't want to uh, uh, slow the process so that you don't respond to a proposal until 
March of next year, but I would be interested in reading them. I'd, I'd come in and read a proposal for my own Oh, you mean, curiosity. so once we receive, so uh, our, once we see, receive um, responses to an RFP, that would be the, the place where everyone's interested in seeing what folks are saying well, as far as... You're yeah. talking about seeing the RFP. Did yeah, you want to see the RFP or do you want to see the responses to the RFP? I would be happy to read the request for an RFP. Okay. But I don't think it needs to come to a committee meeting and then another oh, yeah, six yeah, weeks yeah. and... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I just, for my own Well, we interest. could circulate the, the our, once we have it finalized, and we could circulate it to this group if everyone would like to see it before it goes out the door. Is that what I'm hearing? Sure. Is that, give us two days to look at it. Well, look, you know, I can even give you three if you're in a, <laughs> I don't know. Hey, Karen, um, does it make sense to um, request Peter Matthews to have a second look, you know, with his insurance and maybe a hold harmless and just have him go in and look preliminarily. So I might, I was going to reach, I could certainly reach out to him to see what his, you know, um, thought is about that. And, or if he would tell me, no, I'm not a structural engineer. You really need somebody with that type of a background. I can certainly reach out to him and see what, and see what his thought is. Yeah. Um, I can tell you that he's a, had a pretty affordable on-site visit, you know, um, pr uh, the cost for the on-site consult he does because he couldn't, he couldn't, if everybody who wanted his thoughts and he went out for free, he would never be able to do any work. Um, but I can check with him and find out if well, that's. I've got a lot of experience looking at, you know, building right. failures and repairs and just generally how to deal with what's there. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think he could be a good first person and maybe it speaks to Bob's point too that for not that much money, you might be able to get a, a, a maybe a, f a quick assessment um, and then decide if it needs a full conditions assess we could certainly look at that I can I can find out if that's an area that he'd be comfortable providing more feedback and if he's and got if the insurance covered the building you're gonna see a whole lot and nobody's been down there yet and uh, yeah yeah L let me let me check with both him and check with our town attorney as to what might re be required to allow to allow that that entry um, for sure, yeah. that's a great idea. Megan, for the uh, co conditions assessment, um, do you know what kind of th things they do? Is it just eyeballs? They, they're they looking at stuff or do they physically like take samples or do they drill into the beams to see if there's any rot or? Great question. Um, it could potentially include all of that. I think ultimately it, it will somewhat depend on your RFP and the scope of work you really want them to do. So. You know, you could have a conditions assessment done that's really just a visual. They, they just look at the building. Um, you know, most people who have experience doing this, a visual assessment is really all they need to do. They wouldn't necessarily have to do drilling and all that. But when it comes to, you know, the larger, thicker structural members, it might be something where they'd, you know, want to do a little bit more poking to see, you know, is it just on the outside that you're seeing some rot or is the actual structure good inside still? So. That, that was a... Excellent choice of words because I bet Mr. Matthews will come with an awl and will probe with a pointed, sharp instrument and check penetration into members. Okay. Oh. All right. So we'll continue the conversation at the town board level. Uh, in, the, at, in the meantime, I'll see if I can get a definitive answer from Peter Matthews between now and... Wednesday. Wednesday, <laughs> um, and we'll we'll continue um, on that on that path. All right. Any other questions? Oh, Bob, you look like you got a thought brewing. I love it. Go ahead. It, the the I believe that the viability of of restoring it in its current location is significantly dependent upon the condition of the foundation. And, and Mr. Matthews is probably the, the, the expert here in Rochester for what you'd do if you wanted to jack it up or move it or take it apart. But you, you might want to reach out to a, a foundation, foundation design or to uh, uh, one of the st structural geotechnical engineers to take a same kind of look at the foundation 
Uh, it's, a, it's a different skill set, and they might even be able to do that from the outside, uh, a more detailed. And I think it's Fieldstone low head foundation, but. For a portion, and then there was some. some blocks later. There's, yeah. yeah. There's well, some block if foundation. If it's a restoration, then, then the cinder block gets removed and you build it back the way it was. Uh, but th that foundation system is, is very susceptible to deterioration when it's no longer heated yeah. and when you allow water into it. So I, I think that in addition to looking at the structural integrity of the wood, yeah. that someone should look at the structural integrity of the foundation. And, uh, ABS Foundation Services would be a great place to start. Okay. That wasn't a plug for those watching at home. We would certainly reach out and get quotes from other folks as yeah, well. No, I, <laughs> just, a name that came to mind, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Well, Bob, you're many years in the uh, design field. I know you know all the contractors and all of the providers, so I appreciate your, uh, your, your thoughts here. Um, all right. No, no, go ahead. I was just going to say, are there any other questions or? No, I, I was just trying to think. So it goes to work session Wednesday. Yep. Potentially action item. Potentially. Yep. Right. Depending I have it on the I have it on on the action item list in case there was some next step needed. Okay. Okay. And then this group, I think that it was a, a TBD, right? So no meeting in December, so we wouldn't be able to come back for an update, but we can certainly communicate. Cer yes. We can communicate via email with the group. Um, if we had, like, say, for example, prepare an RFP and we're going to send it around so folks can take right. a look at it and see, oh, hey, what about this or that? You know, the fo folks might have some thoughts about it. We could okay. then include, you know, get that finalized. Okay. Um, so it sounds like this committee is at least in a holding pattern until... We have an uh, RFP the, of okay. some sort. Or we have more... If, if, if the option is we, we've... You know, we we're able to have Peter Matthews come back out and get inside and underneath, and he's able to do that. And that, to me, could be the next step before you go on to full-fledged conditions. And then, to your point, Bob, he is the first one to say, I am not a mason, I'm not a structural, I'm not the person for the foundation. So he might say, you need to have a foundation person come out, and then we could be doing that simultaneously or consecutively potentially okay. before we go to a full RFP for a con conditions assessment. So Carrie, is he going to provide a report? Is that part of what you'll so request? So Peter does not um, own a computer. <laughs> um, so I think it would be us taking notes at the meeting, similar to the last time I presented to you his findings. It was thanks to Tim's handy dandy note working note note taking abilities so we would likely be taking we'd be taking notes and transcribing them based on what his findings are we probably would ask him if he's going to be like be taking photos you know to document to the extent that you can um, so i would work find out exactly what that would entail right actually if he doesn't mind and would be <clears throat> open to it uh, and he barred somebody's iphone if he basically just walks through and talks and dictates, yeah. then that would be both fantastic because we could see what he's looking at and also his interpretation of what he's looking at. Uh, yeah. And that'd be far closer to es essentially the conditions than transcriptions of... Yeah, and I don't know how, I'll be honest with you, I don't know how walkable underneath is if, or if you can just stand in a spot potentially... Yeah. Um, just based on my understanding of the of the current condition, I don't know. I don't know that for sure, so I don't want to say that walking around is going to be an option. Um, I just even know from yeah, just based on I don't know what the the ceiling height is from the ground level up to that first floor. So I I, I don't hit my head going in there. I know um, I'm six one. I was gonna um, say you're super tall. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it is. It's just that corner where it collapsed. Okay. That, that'll be the okay. the problem, and that's like right when you get in that side door underneath. Okay. Yeah. So I, I think let, let's at least see uh, what Peter Matthews can do and circulate okay. an update if we can before the the yep. um, uh, work session, yep. and then if there are other thoughts based on any input then Carrie and I can at least present that yep. um, timely on Wednesday so that there's some 
potential action item. Yep. And then again, I think the this committee is on hold until a uh, potential RFP or potential next steps with Peter. And then January, it looks like you'll just circulate a date. Yep. Okay. I've got to coordinate with um, the auditorium schedule and with PCTV's availability. And then we'll pick it. They've been landing on a Monday or a Wednesday for the most part. So we'll just keep you. I don't know if that's how it's going to happen, but we're, well, as soon as I have some dates, I'll put a, um, a calendar request out and an email. All right. Anything else? Any other last minute thoughts or comments or? I'm just going to reinforce. I really appreciate it as some of the steps happen at the staff level to keep us updated when you think it's significant enough to absolutely uh, share some information. Okay. I appreciate that. Oh, well, thank you. Happy to stay stay informed and connected. If we have any breakthroughs on the historic searching, we'll also. Oh, yeah, Michael, on. I appreciate that. Thank you for doing that. Yeah, yeah, and we'll um, the uh, the idea the idea um, of checking tax records. I'll find out from the tax receiver sort of where we might find the 1800s um, items, <laughs> and so we'll see what might be available. And I don't know if it. I'll we'll have to take a look at that. Anyone, yeah, we can have Amy look at the um, document storage also. Yeah, I, mean, see, I, I don't know. I have no like idea that. what the the archive look like looks like for that that time frame. If you do find like 1820s, 30s tax records, that would be a gold mine. Sure. Put everybody with a tax you know receipt on a map in a GIS and really get the entire town. Oh, all right. Now you got Matt's uh, uh, ears perked up. He's our GIS uh, guru. So, all right, excellent. All right, well, I think um, if there's nothing else, I'm looking at a time of about, last time I, I really messed up the timing, but I think we have, uh, it looks like 6.40 on the clock. Thanks, Matt, for checking my, uh, my time-telling uh, abilities. And we'll call this meeting adjourned. Thank you, Karen. All right, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Megan, thank you, Megan, for your information and guidance. We appreciate it. Yeah.